Hey there everyone, I hope you're all doing well. I've got a very special video for you today. I've been working hard on this for almost two weeks now actually at this point and it's a review, an in-depth review I'm hoping of the Ascar 130 PHQ. I've tried to take this review as seriously as I possibly can because it's kind of a responsibility I think. Um, this is an extremely extremely expensive piece of equipment i think it retails for about four thousand pounds here in the uk so uh, i wanted to do the absolute best job that i could for people so that what that's going to mean is it's not going to be a quick video really by any means i want to try and talk about things not rush through uh completely and i also throughout the course of this review period as you can maybe see i'm clutching a bunch of different notes here that i've kept uh, about my usage of this scope just so i wouldn't forget things and accidentally gloss over anything or anything like that so the scope of this video uh what we're actually going to touch upon i will add timestamps as i uh, respect your time and i'm sure not everybody's going to watch this one through in uh, in its complete form so um we're going to be taking a little talk about packaging and delivery the build quality of the scope the native optical performance when used for astrophotography at 1000 millimeters of focal length also, a report on its use when used visually. That was an interesting one. Then, we're going to take a delve into its performance with the 0.7 times reducer at 55 millimeters back focus. That's its native back focus requirement, and also another experimental back focus um, that I kind of figured out myself. And I th think, you know, there's a lot to talk about with that. I'm just going to say that right now. Uh, we're also going to touch upon some bad points, good points, and a couple of suggestions also for Ascar. So, um, yeah, strap yourselves in. For anybody interested in this telescope, I've got an awful lot of information for you. I think, and I really do genuinely hope that this is interesting to you because it's actually been quite a lot of fun for me to do to uh, try and put some form to a video for once rather than it being completely uh, random. So let's dive in and we can start with uh, the packaging and delivery. I think we, I'm gonna have some accompanying images and things to go along with certain things. All I had to say about this was superb. Uh, it came with a good, strong flight case, not the kind of flimsy ones that you might find. I would liken it to, for anybody who's got experience with these, the Skywatcher Esprit uh, range of flight cases and the case that came with my EQ8. That kind of build quality is a real solid one. Um, came double boxed which was also good and in between the second box on the inside and the actual flight case itself it was packed out with foam arrestor blocks so there was absolutely no room for wiggle or anything like that uh 10 out of 10 i'd say for our packaging build quality um so let's try and try and address these points as we go uh extremely impressed is where i wrote down my initial thoughts here Nothing is loose fitting. Uh, the paint job is really fantastic. Uh, that's one of my favorite things about the kind of aesthetic of this telescope. It's a textured, like a powder coat kind of thing with a speckled finish. Uh, I should have some video for you to show you what I'm talking about on that one. Absolutely no dew shield flop, which is something that is the bane of many refractor owners' existences. Um, I have to say my own Esprit 120 suffers from dew shield flop. I had to correct that manually. Should never have been there in the first place, but it was. So it's good to see the Ascar has absolutely none of it. I think you could do pull-ups off the dew shield on this thing. Um, very smooth spot focuser. I uh, made sure to write an extra bullet point beneath this. I wouldn't dream of replacing it. So no thought entered my head of changing this out with a moonlight or anything like that if I owned the scope. EAF, I fed that to it. Um, it was easy as, well, F, <laughs> if you like. It really was very easy. It took no effort whatsoever. All the things that came in the box for the EAF were the things that I used for fitting it to this focuser. Uh, nothing needed doing. Two minute job. Really, really easy. The rotator lock that's on the telescope um, initially. I was slightly concerned about that, given that it's a one-sided adjustment bolt. Uh, I thought there was a chance it could cause deflection on the image or something like that when tightened down, but I'm happy to say, absolutely zero. Now, we can jump into the actual main 
kind of reports. So uh, native optics when used for astrophotography. So I'm just going to switch the scene on this thing and hopefully you can see my um, PixInsight desktop right here. I've got a lot of images to go along with this and uh, <laughs> I hope that these are useful to you. So uh, first of all, I guess we should talk about the fact that this thing has arrived and it's absolutely perfectly flat. Um, I took some aberration inspector images so here you can see this is just a one-to-one -one screen capture. We can take a look at the actual data properly in just a moment, but if we just zoom this up on the screen, hopefully you guys can see, you know, all the stars are pinpricked right across the field. I don't really see a difference between the stars in the center of the field and those right at the edge of an APS-C sensor. I was very, very impressed with that. Um, I was able to test the tilt on this, uh, this telescope because I've been using my camera on my Raster 8, which is ludicrously sensitive to tilt so that's the first thing you always have to deal with when using that kind of telescope so i know that my camera sensor is totally flat and i have to say that when used on this telescope that's borne out by this report right here as you can see tilt one percent measured as none uh off-axis aberrations are also extremely extremely small 0 0.13 half flux diameter and as you can see as well, the uh, HFD, HFR, I can't remember which it's actually using for this, across the field, as denoted by ASTAP's uh, image inspection report of this scope, it bears that out. 4.55 bottom left, 4.56 top left, 5.4 top right, 5.4 bottom right, 5.1 in the middle, you know, it's, it's wonderfully flat and uh, I think the images also tell that same story. Now, um... If we just move on a little bit and take a look now, this is the actual first light from this telescope, so I wanted to point it at something very high up. Uh, the least amount of atmospheric influence that I possibly could for this test, and this is just unfortunately just 10 5 minute exposures uh, before clouds came and ruined everything, as they usually do. But if I just zoom in a little bit, oh, this is a one to one view, you can see it's wonderfully sharp already, even just uh, from my shoddy skies. If you take a look around the image top left, let's say we go to a maybe a three to one zoom right there. And then we'll take a look at the absolute bottom left. Once again, you can see we're not seeing evidence of any lateral chromatic aberration really creeping in or anything like that, which you might expect at the corners of a frame. Maybe there's the absolute slightest uh, a fringe. It's very hard to say on my uh, screen right now. Let me know what you guys see top right just the same all the way across the field uh stars look wonderful i this is the, this is the scope's true strength what is when it's used at its native configuration of a thousand millimeters its optical performance is wonderful nothing short of wonderful if i just apply i've got it ready to go right here blur exterminator to this thing you can see uh it's able to bring out a bunch more detail that's already locked away in that image and then already tight stars so let's take a look absolute bottom right for instance get even tighter so uh it stands up really well to deconvolution that kind of thing and uh, i have to say i'm very impressed now some of my comments on this uh remarkable sharpness it was immediately apparent uh, i've tested it up to APS-C with my player one poseidon as you can imagine and i also remarked I feel it would stand up to any scrutiny. Uh, perfect across the whole field. That was my uh, my comment on this. And I realise perfect is a strong word, but I think it is. I think it's perfect. I can't see any telescope out there, really, uh, of this kind of class. A uh, five-inch refractor beating it. I think it's, it's fabulously good performance. Um, now, what we've got on the screen right here is one hour of unfiltered again data allow me to correct myself really quickly there i say unfiltered it was actually a uv ir cut filter i used for this an astronomic l2 so just a standard luminance filter um and my one shot color camera this was a test on alnitak as you can see this star is infamous for being the bane of many astrophotographers uh, existences as it's notoriously very hard to shoot without getting different reflections and strange illuminations happening across your image and i'm happy to say even when it's kind of off axis across to one side right there 
hopefully you can see this on the video there's nothing there's nothing to worry about whatsoever it looks wonderful and uh, the rest of the image is actually for just one hour from bottle seven skies and uh, effectively no filtration really quite nice and uh, and sharp i was very impressed with that so um the rest of my perform report should i say on that that's about it really uh color correction is perfect i also marked that down Zero halos and reflections were notable on Alnitak, as we've just been <laughs> talking about. That's another thing I marked down. Now, visual report for you really quickly before we dive into the rest of this. Uh, I actually had a few friends around. We shared some views of Jupiter, Mars, the Moon, and M45. Uh, they all very much enjoyed themselves. They're not um, experienced observers or anything by any means, and neither am I, if I'm being completely honest with you. But I decided all the same. To let you know what I thought about its performance when used visually with the exact same Barlow and IP setup that I used on my Mead LX200, that's a 10 inch Schmidt cast screen, that I have had a bit of eyepiece time with. Um, I thought that was the absolute fairest way to compare this. So, um, what did I see now? Very good contrast, no halos visible, even on you know, extremely high contrast targets like the limb of the moon uh, or the moon edge going into the Terminator or indeed Jupiter itself. Um, no halos. Detail well beyond what the aperture would suggest uh, is another point that I made, and I absolutely agree with that. And particular part of the report here we got on the 29th of the 12th, 2022, at 7 p.m. GMT. Um, I watched Europa's transit and exit of the disk of Jupiter. Uh, it allowed me to view the event in fantastic clarity and contrast, able to view black space in between Jupiter and Europa when less than one moon's width of space was between them and this was almost like an astro photo because I've taken a mental picture of it it's seared into my mind that much that was a really fantastic view um, I was just impressed I could see that kind of thing um, I watched Europa grow from being just a little bump on the side of Jupiter to actually fully split in and I watched the whole thing in real time occurring and shared that with another friend too that was a really nice uh, memory but yeah I was then able to watch Europa's shadow cross Jupiter's face and I, I summarized that with a, a final comment of loved it <laughs> I um next up what we can talk about is what's on the screen right now actually so this is where things for me took a little bit of a turn for the worse, if I'm being totally honest with you. So the 0.7 times reducer at 55 millimeters of back focus. So in the box for the reducer, it comes with a little slip telling you the different configurations that you can use it at. And when used, excuse me, how I did uh, with the M48 male adapter on the end, you're supposed to achieve 55 millimeters of back focus from the leading face of that M48 adapter to your sensor's focal plane. Um, my notes from this. So noticeable softening of the image uh, is what I saw. Stars in the corners show and I had to search up exactly what it was that I was seeing. <laughs> Tangential and sagittal astigmatism is exactly what it looks like. And if I just zoom in right here. so bottom right image in this if I just make sure this is visible for you guys so a four to one zoom really quite severe I realize but I figure this is the best way to show you what I'm talking about so if I just show you that you can see it's like this in every corner uh, we're getting some radial I've, I've actually written down lateral chromatic aberration I think that's what it actually is uh, is visible when used with the dual narrowband filter. So this was taken with an Optolong L Extreme. Now, you can see that chromatic aberration manifesting itself by left. Uh, the left-hand side of the stars is blurred out towards the red end of the spectrum, and the right on this particular corner is uh, towards the green and blue. That's the oxygen and the hydrogen making up this image. And you can see also the uh, astigmatism in play here. So stars that should be round when used with the reducer are instead kind of squashed in this axis and then in this axis too. Tangential and sagittal, apparently. Now then, um, it's like this in each corner. If I can just show you, uh, top left is showing that same lateral chromatic aberration. Top right, if I just scroll across to it. 
you see that same thing occurring. It's it's equal at least, but that all that really tells me is I think that the reducer itself uh, is collimated properly, so there's not an optical element out of alignment or something like that during shipment. I just don't think it's a great match for this telescope, if I'm being brutally honest with you, which, uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be. Now, to take this one step further, I also want to apply Blur Exterminator and kind of show you that shape that I'm talking about. So this is the astigmatism that we're able to view now properly. Now that the yeah, image has been deconvolved, um, you can hopefully see that effect that I'm talking about. If I just undo and redo, that shape becomes a lot more pronounced. Towards the middle of the field, I mean, it's not too bad. Uh, if I just go back to the normal view, as you can see, not too bad. But when compared to when used native, I think native looks considerably sharper and also has no visible chromatic aberration when used at a thousand millimeters. It's, you know, color perfect, I would say. Now, uh, further notes on this. Now, I made a second report, if you like, uh, where I experimented with the back focus of this reducer. So it asked for 55 millimeters. I messed around a little bit and actually came to the conclusion that 60 millimeters uh, gave me better sharpness but not as good as native performance but by 60 millimeters back focus the astigmatism seemed to be massively reduced and the lateral chromatic aberration was reduced also um, I'm going to try and evidence that for you right now on the screen so if I just go to that same bottom corner where it was really obvious that um, astigmatism that we were looking at I almost confused it for coma at first, like you'd see on a uh, reflector. I've seen this kind of thing before. But if I just copy this view across to this other set of data, so on the right, as you can see from the header, this was 55 millimeters of back focus. I should say that these are all the exact same exposure time, one hour in each case. Um, and then on the left, 60 millimeters of back focus. You can see it looks like the chromatic aberration is reduced uh there's certainly less of that spurious red glow being cast off to the sides and the green glow to the right in this bottom left corner as we're observing it and also as i've mentioned that astigmatism seems to be largely corrected the stars are back to being round again which is uh, obviously a good thing to see and it's really the same kind of report throughout the rest of the image so if we take a look is this maybe a good region in the top left once again, as you can see what we're talking about, uh, I'll apply Blur Exterminator to both of these and hopefully you can see. For my money, the reducer definitely works better at 60 millimeters of back focus. Now, I realize this sounds a bit ridiculous, just some backyard astronomer guy uh, thinking he's figured it out better than Asgar. Uh, but what can I say? You know, I have experimented with this and I, I've played around with a lot of telescopes in my time. <laughs> So, I, you know, I have figured out a thing or two. It looks to me like I have the spec sheet is off. Uh, I know for sure that my back focus calculations are not off. I've triple checked those again and again and again. I didn't want to make a stupid mistake and uh, make a fool of myself with this. So this, this truly is at 55 millimeters and 60 millimeters, not accounting for filter thickness uh, into the equation. But even so, when you account for filter thickness, you use uh, about a third of the glass thickness, which in this case would have been, I think, 0.5 millimeters of back focus added. And that certainly was not doing anything. I tried this at 55, 57, and then I jumped all the way up to 60 uh, because I was seeing marked improvement each time. And it looks like 60 for me is the sweet spot. However, I'm going to be honest with you, that said, uh, my personal recommendation with the reducer is I, I can't recommend it uh, my, my final point on this that I left was the scope is so good that it deserves better uh, and I stand by that I think the performance of this scope when used at a thousand millimeters is perfect so to kind of actively damage it just doesn't seem like a, uh, a good idea I, uh, I can't really recommend the reducer as, as nice of a piece of equipment it is, it feels brilliant in the hand. Um, 
it, you know, if it was my telescope, I, I'd, I wouldn't want to use it. I'd be using a native all the time. Now, um, as you can see, once again, here is that native performance, by the way, when we check in those same corners before I go off on another tangent. Um, let's take a look at the absolute corner of the um, unreduced image. So if we just go right there, we've got a couple of nice bright stars in the field of view. We'll copy this view across to the other images. So as you can see, if I just undo that blur exterminator on these, even by this point, we're seeing clear evidence of uh, the chromatic aberration that's been brought in by that reducer at 55 millimeters. I'd say it's definitely worse than at 60 millimeters once again i think it seems to be much better when used at that particular back focus um and we are still seeing in some small way some evidence of that astigmatism also even when you know nowhere near really the actual corner of this thing now the thing that bothered me the most about the reducer is i'm only using this on an aps-c sensor and it's marked as, as being able to support a full frame sensor and i just I just don't think that that's the case, uh, unless I've got a damaged unit, which I don't think I have, because uh, everything's perfectly equal in all of these corners. Nothing seems to be knocked out of alignment. <clears throat> then that could be a possibility, but uh, yeah, just based on the information that I have to hand, I can't recommend the reducer. I can absolutely recommend the scope, though. <laughs> I want to make that one clear. Um, now... On to any bad points. So, uh, as long as heck is what I wrote here, uh, it's heavy and the reducer is not good enough. I've clearly gone over that point more than enough by this, uh, by this point in the video. Good points. Razor sharp, natively at a thousand millimeters. Practically zero vignette on APS-C. I, uh, I wrote down a little bullet point to go along with this, mentioning the fact that when kind of checked it out using uh, Nina's ADU measurement tool. Uh, the mean ADUs towards the center of an image uh, effectively indistinguishable from those at the corner of the image on an APS-C size sensor. Maybe a 3 or 4% drop off, something like that, you know, just not noticeable. Build quality, uh, another good point, and the color correction. Uh, perfect, I thought. Really, really, really real, wonderful performance on this telescope uh, at native can't stress that enough suggestions uh, for Asuka uh, would be nice to see a mounting bulk kit is what I wrote uh, for accessories as I think it uses M6 potentially bolts you know I've got a few M6 bolts lying around but I don't think everybody has um, so it's just one of those things where you'd have to maybe if you want to mount stuff to your telescope which Let's face it, you're going to. You're going to have to also buy some bolts. So I thought it might, for the cost of bolts, to, that match the rest of them use on the telescope already, such as the ones that hold on the dovetail onto the um, tube rings. Just add a few more of those in the box for people to use for bolting things on. That might be uh, a cool inclusion. A revised reducer. That thing really stuck in my, uh, in my throat, as you can tell. Uh... Rotation markings on the draw tube that would also be nice to see not really You know desperately important Now that is most of my points on this thing um, I am gonna go ahead and supply you with that unboxing video also And then if you want to skip away or wherever you want to see the final image that I'm going to show from this where I Effectively just added together these data sets and uh, I'm going to process them right after this video is finished recording actually then uh, i hope that you enjoy the final image from this it will be three hours of data nothing more unfortunately we've had very bad skies but i have been doing my absolute best to get this review created for you uh for you guys for anybody interested in this telescope so i hope that this has been useful to some of you out there i'm sorry if it's been a little bit chaotic i have done my absolute best to try and get across all the points that i wanted to share with you um and i'd also like to just thank everybody for all of your support in getting to me this me to this point should i say um it's thanks to you guys and all the help that you've given me in building this channel that companies like Asgar at this point 
for reaching out and uh, i am very genuinely thankful to you all so um yeah i think that's about it from me guys anyway so uh, until the next one look after yourselves and uh clear skies hey everyone my name is luke and welcome to my channel i am very happy to be bringing you this one today as you can see in front of me i've got a big black flight case of mystery <laughs> but um seriously now ask i got in contact just recently and asked if i'd like to take a look at some of their products to review and absolutely i would so i said yes and here we are they asked me what scope i'd like to take a look at and after watching fairly recently nico carver's own review on the telescope that's in this box which should be no mystery to you by the <laughs> thumbnail and title of this video i imagine it's an ascar 130 phq um, i loved the look of it on his review and i thought i'd like to take a look at the same thing myself so that's why i requested and uh, they were all too happy now i haven't received any compensation for this or anything like that uh, all i've got to do is provide you guys with a review that's the transaction that's going on here and uh, once i'm done with the scope i can either send it back to ascar at the end of the review period or should I wish, I can buy it from them and keep it. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Now, without any further ado, uh, I'm gonna get this thing just slightly unboxed and we'll take a little bit of a look step by step. I'll try and get some close-ups on things for you as well. But I wanna keep this as raw as possible. Um, excuse me while I have a sniff, I just love the smell of new stuff. Um, got a little bit of packaging right there to keep the dew shield end of the scope safe which i have to say looks wonderful uh, it doesn't really come across i imagine in videos and photographs online but this thing's got a i'm going to try and get a close-up for you like a speckled paint job to it and it looks so premium i uh, really like to see that so the top of the box right here we've got a inspection checklist some stickers a little tag and an English instruction manual uh, and a screw for the bottom of the focuser. Again, I'll get some close-ups for that kind of thing. And uh, wow, yeah, I have to say, ever since seeing, again, Nico's video, um, I think I've broken one of the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm sure it's one of them that thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's refractor. And I coveted it. So um, <laughs> here we are. I hope you'll excuse how daft I'm feeling today. I'm gonna to have to pause the video and get this thing out because uh, I'm gonna need all the leverage I can get. It's hefty. All right guys, so I've got it out, as you can see in the hand. It is a blooming big scope. Um, I'm no small bloke by any means. Uh, it looks pretty big in my hands. So I'm just gonna bob this down to one side for just a second. Really impressed by the feeling of that. I can't wait to get it unbagged, but I did notice when I lifted it out, um, some little blanking plates covering up the adapters, which are all nicely nestled. There's a, uh, I believe it's a set of four, really highly quality machining by the look of this actually, just as I pull that out. Matte finished, matte on the inside too, so chance of internal reflections really low. Um, yeah, beautiful quality, but it's a set of adapters that steps it down from, I think, M86. Yeah, that's right, that's the largest one all the way down to M48 male. So um, every type of adapter you could need, that's really nice to see included with the scope and not being some sort of <laughs> optional extra. I'm gonna put this flight case to one side now. I'm gonna take a look at this scope and kind of unbag it. All right guys, so we're back with the scope now. As you can see, I've got it somewhere safe where it can't so easily roll off. They feel really nice. The uh, tube ring locks I have to say, a little nylon bush there to protect uh, your tube rings from getting marred. Good to see that some thought's gone into that. Just undo that one and drop this tube ring back. So we're gonna have to open this up like a uh, clamshell, almost, and just lift out the tube as carefully as I possibly can. Keep this to one side for now. And let's get this scope debagged. Um, Good to see, it comes so well packaged. Um, I have to say the exterior box as well that it arrived in, it came double boxed. Um, 
absolutely zero damage to the exterior of the box, so top marks to the delivery company at least. But even if there had been a little mishap, I'm pretty sure it would have survived. It came double boxed and bushed with uh, lots and lots of packaging materials. This thing is such a lump, I have to say. <laughs> I guess it's one of those things where if you haven't actually picked up a, uh, an apochromite refractor, and this is a quadruplet, so it's extra heavy, in person, you, you can't really appreciate just how hefty they feel. It's, it's a lot heavier than my Rasser 8, for example. Um, and I'd say it's heavier than the Esprit 120 as well, which is also a massive lump of a scope, really. Now, this paint finish, forgive me for a moment for just appreciating that, but the, the feel of it, even the, the sound of it as you drag your nail across, lovely to see. Um, and it's really, really evenly finished. There's no blemishes whatsoever. It's, um, well, it's about what you'd expect for a scope in this price range. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's a premium scope and it feels like a premium scope. So top marks to ask our the focuser. We can just have a little actuate of that. I turn this around a second and just prop it up. So this is the coarse side of the focusing wheel. Super smooth, silky smooth in fact. It feels like a good spin on that and the uh, <laughs> the weight of the focuser wheel would keep it moving. And now we're gonna try the uh, micro focuser side. Beautiful, effortless, you know what I mean? You could just turn it around with one finger. No drag, no graunchiness to it, anything. Uh, now, if I give this a little bit of a, a feel, if I just arrest it with one arm for any slack and slop, there is none. It's able to be moved, pushed in physically with a bit of effort, as you can see, I'm overcoming it. But as to backlash and slop and anything like that, none. Really, really impressed by that focuser. I do have an EAF that I'm actually going to put on this thing because it comes with holes pre-drilled ready for it uh, so it actually fitting onto this is supposed to be a complete breeze it's such a high quality instrument and I've always loved refractors um, I don't think I'll, I'll ever not really as much as I enjoy my Rasa the soft, the soft spot's still there for quality big glass like this um, I have to say just taking a look at these mega high quality Never seen a pair of tube rings as high quality as that, actually. Uh, again, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe I went into this with expectations too low. I don't know for, for what reason, but I'm impressed by the look of that. I'm going to get all this attached now anyway. So there is a chance. I realize I'm talking nonsense to you, but this is the, the way of my videos. There is a chance that tonight I might get a an initial first light and I'm just going to use that as a test session very early on just to see if everything looks optically sound like it hasn't got jostled around in transit even with though no visible uh, external damage to the box so yeah anyway guys look after yourselves uh, I hope you're all well and I hope we get some clear skies <laughs>